this video is going to cover multi-group models. And so most of this is taken from the Brown book. The Beaujon book explains more how to do this in Levon, but the Brown book really covers in depth the set of steps that I'm going to talk about. So kind of a quick set of new terms for this section is we're gonna use the term invariant and invariants a lot. And really what that means is equivalent, meaning they don't vary in different situations. So the structure, the items, the means, the intercepts, those are all going to be equal, hopefully, if this works. So a better definition of invariant, to me, is like under different conditions, do those measurements yield the same measurement of attributes? So this set of tests is really to see if groups, since it's a multi-group CFA, um, are the same on their measurement in the same scale. And I love multigroups because uh, you can't lose. Either the scale is perfectly invariant or equivalent across groups, which is always good to know, or it's not, and that's an interesting question as an investigation into why it's not. So you can't go wrong, really. So um, by doing this, though, we're going to switch from a covariance-only model to a means and covariances model. And so we have to estimate both means and covariances. Before, we were estimating only covariances. Um, and that change really allows us to test more information. Rather than just correlations between items, we're also going to be able to get into intercepts. And we haven't really worked with those a whole lot yet. Um, but we're also going to add them for latent growth curves. So it's important now to start talking about them. So with intercepts, um, what what is that really? So in a regular regression we have y equals a plus bx and a is the intercept but the way that a is calculated is, is that the y intercept is the mean of y and so that's my best guess for what someone's gonna score if I don't have any information about x is just the mean. That's sort of how ANOVA works too. It's the mean for each group um, and so Intercepts are just simply the mean for that item. Or if you want to think about this in a global sense for lots of items, it's kind of like a start value for a manifest variable. So it's the average score for that, for that item. Or for me, it's a start value because generally these, these loadings are positive. So people tend to start you know, at this score and then they go up or they go down. Um, a latent mean is a calculation of the score for each participant on their items times that path coefficient for the item. So the score that they got on item one times path coefficient for item one plus the score they got for item two times path coefficient, meh, 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 meh. Um, and that is a weighted mean. Uh, and we don't tend to do those very often that I've seen anyways we tend to focus on just subtotals or average factor scores but in this section we'll get into talking about how you can calculate weighted scores which are much more useful sometimes than um, total scores Oops, sorry all right so endogenous questions will get intercepts um, so anytime you have a variable coming or an arrow coming in, you're going to get an intercept because they have an average score for that item, um, and we're predicting it, so it's y, right? Anytime you have an exogenous variable, it's going to get a, a latent mean or a mean score. In CFA, it's almost always a latent mean because we're talking about the latent variables. In a mimic multiple indicators, um, multiple causes model, it might be also be a square, but Exogenous variables get means estimated on them, so hence latent means, and endogenous variables get intercepts, so that's why we're going to focus on um, investigating those each separately, even though they're both means. They just have different terms. Uh, to come back to our friend identification, when I add in estimating means and intercepts, you're obviously going to be estimating more for each variable because now each square has got a path coefficient, an error term, and an intercept. So um, even more options. And the latent variables have variances and means. So we're adding to the number of things we're estimating. Um, and so what we can do is standardize on the latent, 
and that'll set a latent mean to zero. So this is like a z-score. Um, not super popular because most people want the latent mean in the scale of the data. Instead, we can scale on our manifest variable or our marker score, which fixes one of those variables to one, and it sets that particular intercept to zero. Um, and so it actually fixes multiple things at once, so it's going to estimate that question as the path coefficient is 1 and the intercept is 0, which again is very similar to the idea of a z-score. Okay. Um, or we could do effects coding, but it's really not popular at all, so we're going to leave it out. So the purpose of this analysis is several fold. And I think about it as a global scale assessment. So do those items act the same across groups? Do they give you the same average score? Do they have the same weight to their factor? Do they have the same variance? Because um, sometimes you might have the same average but have a different spread of the variance, which is still interesting. Okay. So is the factor structure the same across groups? So are the items even correlated with the same factor across these different groups? Um, are those paths equal across groups, so the, their relationship to the factor are the same, the latent means equal, and does the whole thing replicate? So we're going to be able to focus in on small pieces of the model and look at the, the groups, um, look at each group's loadings separately. So their intercepts, their loadings, their variances, all that stuff, making sure we can focus on just one piece at a time instead of just kind of, is this the same for each group? Sorry, my printer was making a funny noise, so there should be less noise in here now. <clears throat> so a quick note, um, you can do more than two groups, don't recommend. So anytime you have um, three or more levels, this gets very complicated very fast, um, and it becomes difficult to fit because naturally more groups are going to vary, and so generally this is usually only a comparison of two groups. Um, and so um, it just becomes very hard when you have more than two groups, but it is doable, it's just difficult. So we're going to walk through the steps one at a time, and there's four official steps and two sort of unofficial ones. So we'll start with the unofficial ones. First, you have to test that model as a regular CFA. So we've done this a bunch of times since this point in the semester, and so everyone is thrown into the data set and that model is the least restrictive. So the idea behind a multi-group analysis is that you start loosey-goosey, to use a terrible uh, phrase, you start least restrictive and slowly add more and more constraints until you've said these are exactly the same. So at first we're allowing them to do sort of whatever and then we're bringing them together and saying no you gotta be the same, gotta be the same, gotta be the same. Yes, they're the same. So we start by not grouping them, we just throw this all into one big uh, CFA, because if the regular CFA is bad, maybe multi-group testing isn't one the reason that um, where you need to start. You need to start with a model that fits, and then work on does this model fit the same for each group. Um, even if this step is particularly poor, I also recommend the next step, um, because it might be that your your regular CFA is bad because one group is good and one group is bad, and that sort of averages out to mediocre, but then after that, the steps that we'll talk about aren't appropriate because you need to figure out why that one group's model is bad. So first start with a regular CFA, see if it fits okay. Second, test each group separately. So subset the data into group one and group two, and then test each one on that CFA structure. Often your fit indices are going to decrease here because the sample size before was large, and now we've split it in half, essentially. Um, and if you're working with different racial or ethnic groups, you're, all, you're usually gonna have a smaller minority group, uh, especially if you're in the Midwest. So, um, this is where you can have some, maybe the models aren't perfect because the sample size is smaller and that's okay. Um, so we often have trouble finding um, minority groups and men. And so those models tend to fit slightly worse because uh, smaller sample sizes 
the air variance tends to get a little larger because individuals can influence the air more. Um, so generally we're just making sure that they're okay. If one model fits really, really well and the other model fits total crap, this is where you'd stop and try and figure out why the, uh, the, the crap model is crap. Um, so you're essentially trying to figure out why that model didn't work very well. Um, so here, you don't compare them to each other because they are the exact same model, just with different participants. So a model comparison isn't appropriate, but you are looking to see if fit indices are wildly different. Um, and there's no hard and fast rule for this particular step or this one, the first one here. Uh, you just want to kind of make sure it fits and it looks okay. All right. If both of these are kind of okay, you would move on to the nested steps. So these are called nested. Sometimes I use the word stacked because stacked makes a little more sense. Um, but uh, there are a lot of food acronyms in this example. So here we go. But to kind of take your two different group models and group them and stack them together like pancakes. And so the question then becomes, are these even both pancakes? Are they both the same type of pancake? Are the pancakes dot oh, like we're both talking chocolate chip pancakes are the chocolate chips in the same place so we're getting more and more restricted on the question that we're asking so we're going to stack these models together and for these particular steps most people use the confirm applied confirmatory factor analysis book from brown his terms and procedure um, however, there are sort of a mix of different terms that I've seen and a different set of rules. So the, the explanation in the Bojan book is kind of a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one. Um, but what I've seen published the most are Brown's terms and procedures. I think it's kind of the most well cited. Um, and so that's the thing we're going to go with for the rest of this section. So if you see someone else talking about different types of variances um, or invariants, um, it's not wrong, it's just different. So here are all the different possible things that we could test. So we can test the entire model picture, that model structure. We can test the loadings, which are the regression weights, um, path coefficients, same thing. We can test the intercepts, so the y-intercept for each item or each manifest variable. We can test those error variances um, on those manifest variables. We can test the factor variance, so the variance of the latent score, the factor covariance, which is correlation, or factor means. So that's a lot of stuff. Generally, what we're going to do are these first four, and then these last three are kind of their own separate thing. So we'll talk about the first four and then get into when people do the last three. It's kind of going back to regression. Every Y, so remember here, Y is the manifest variable. It's the, the item on the scale, is a combination of the intercept for that item plus a path coefficient times the participant's actual score on the item, or what you would have you know, guessed it been, plus error. So the latent variables are predicting the manifest variables. So this here is what you would have expected them to score just sort of a little weird to think about, but if I'm trying to predict their score, it's some combination of the average, a weight that that score gets to my latent variable, and a little bit of error. So we're gonna test each of these separately to determine if and where things are different by group. So, first step. Sometimes it's called equal form. More often you'll see it called configural invariance. Configural invariance just sounds like a bad um, doctor's note, but it really means that the configuration of the model is different between groups, or if it's invariant, it is not different. So um, we take those two groups and we nest them together in the same model. What we did before is we subset. It's only males or only females. Now what we're going to do is say, well, we have this male layer, or pancake, and female pancake, and are they even both pancakes, or is one of them a muffin? This is what we're doing at this point. Okay. So we don't force any of the paths to be the same, any of the loadings to be the same, none of that. But we're making sure that the, the picture is the same. So item one goes with factor one for both groups. 
So do they show that same configuration? If that step works, you would move on to metric invariance. So metric invariance, we're forcing all the loadings to be the same. Um, and I don't have a good mnemonic for this one, sorry. So um, I expect the weight from the factor to the item to be the same for each group. And so this really tests if each item has the same strength for both, both groups of participants. Um, or is one item for one group particularly bad because it doesn't apply to them, but uh, another item for this group, a separate group, good. So this will really tell you if all of your items um, are useful for both groups. Um, or if some of them have different signs, so one's, for one group it's positive and another group is negative, that's not quite as common as just different strengths. For one group it's a really good item, for another group it's sort of a bad item. If that model is okay, you then get more restrictive. So what we're doing between each of these models, so this one, everything can do whatever it wants as long as they're in the same room. And this one, we have to have, be in the same room and have the same, excuse me, the same loadings. So we're adding restrictions as we go. We don't turn them off and on. So it's the same structure and the same loadings. In the next model, it's the same structure, same loadings, and same intercepts. So we're adding constraints as we go. That's why I said we went from least restrictive to most restrictive. So in this model, what we're doing is forcing the intercepts to be the same. And this is the average score for each question. And in my experience of doing these models, this is usually where it busts. And um, if something is going to not work, or be equivalent between groups is often um, the average score. So people just start in different places. Um, and so the y, this is the y-intercept. So some, maybe some participants are more likely to score lower on this item, while others are likely to score higher. I often think of this as sort of, a, not GPA, but that idea that people just start in different places. Um, and so if this one breaks, the, that means that there's a difference in the average scores for the items. And generally, this is the one where it breaks down. Um, it could stop working at any point, but in my experience, it's this one. But if this is all okay, you would move on to strict factorial invariance. And so that's the picture, the loadings, the intercepts, and the error variances. Um, and so we're forcing the spread around the mean to be the same as well. So this will tell me if that variance or the spread of the distribution for that item is the same for each group. And uh, that says each item, that should be group. Here, let's fix that. Uh, uh, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so the spread of each item is the same for each group. And if you get a significant difference here, that indicates that one group's spread is much larger than the other groups. So this is actually a test of heterogeneity this idea that one group has a more kurtotic distribution, so it's flatter, and one group is skinnier. Um, and I've actually seen this happen in a model that we published, and I think this is one of the examples that I have, where it, to me really what it indicated was that people endorsed a wider range on the scale than others. So we might have the same mean, so our histograms have the same middle, but one group has a small spread and the other group has a much larger spread. And that gives us the same average score, but much a pretty different variance. So you're less able to predict the group with larger variances because their spread is flatter. So yeah, I can tell you the mean is four, but they're picking everything from one to seven, so it's kind of a crapshoot whether you get it right. But for the group with the smaller variance, if their mean is four and they're picking three to five, I'm doing much better at predicting them. Um, so having a widespread amount of variance is really sort of interesting because it indicates heterogeneity. And it also indicates that maybe that item is not as good as you want it to be because you're getting such a wide range of answers for people. Or maybe it implies something related to the question that you're asking. Um, and that's where you really go back and look at the item and say, why, is I'm, why am I getting what I'm getting on this item? Should I be getting that on this item? And if so, then it's fine. Why is one group much smaller than the other group? 
And that's generally where people stop. Um, another set of things that you can do is like, back up for a second, this piece here, so everything we've done from equal form to metric to scalar to strict is all on the items themselves. So this tests the, the structure of the items, the um, loading of the item to the factor, the intercept and the variance, all for the manifest variables. Instead, what you could be interested in is the, the latent variables themselves. So this tends to be called population heterogeneity questions. Um, and so this is a switch from items to latents. And what I can do is I can test the variance for a factor. So do those variances have the same set, or sorry, do those factors have the same set of variances? So their overall score, do we see the same spread? So this is um, a heterogeneity test. Do they have the same correlation between factors? So are, Ida, are the latent variables equally covarying? Um, and do they have equal latent means? So is the overall sort of weighted score the same for each group? These two, not so popular. The latent means pretty popular. And so we'll talk about how, what people sometimes do is get through the first four steps and then just do latent means. But you can, as, if you can kind of get what's going on here, um, the first four steps are really about the items, and that to me is scale development. I'm really interested in how this scale functions as a scale for different groups. This is more about the, the phenomenon you're trying to measure as a whole. So do these groups have different overall scores? Do they have different correlations between items, or do they have different spreads of the scores? And that's not really totally about the scale. I mean, it's measured by the scale, but that's more about the the kind of global thing you're trying to measure. <clears throat> so I stole this book, I think this is from the Brown. And so it's kind of trying to visually depict some of this stuff. <clears throat> so in this first example, A, this is where they have equal loadings and intercepts. So they have equal um, weights to their factor and equal intercepts. So you can see here that it's going to cross this axis um, at the same place. In the second one, they have equal loadings. So the slope is the same for each variable, um, but they have unequal intercepts. So you see they're going to cross the y-axis in a slightly different place, each one. Um, this C step, not nearly as common, where I have an equal intercept. So the same average score, but different weights. And then the last one, albeit not the best picture, one should be flatter than the other, um, is unequal everything. So they have totally different paths. So it's kind of, in a sense, a moderation analysis of group by these different things. So we're really looking for an interaction. Do the groups have different paths, different loadings, um, different intercepts, and different variances? Um, so I've talked about how all these steps, but how do I tell if I should stop at a step? Or how do I know when this model blows up or breaks? Okay. We do expect fit to get worse as we go, because as you go, you get more and more restrictive. And more restrictive models um, with more constraints just are worse. They're harder to fit because you have all these different rules that they have to follow. So we can use change in chi-square. These are nested models hence the term, um, the pancaked models. Um, but we've talked a lot all semester about how chi-square is just not a good determiner for nested model differences. It's overly sensitive. So almost everyone uses this change in CFI test that um, I mentioned at the beginning of the semester. So any drop in fit more than 0 0.01 is bad. So 0 0.011 is where you start saying that models are significantly different, or the groups are different somewhere. Um, this is why you want to use CFI to three decimal places. So what do you do if they're not invariant, which to me is not not equal, but are not equal. So what happens if my CFI indicates that mod this model step to this, the next model step didn't work? And so there are differences between models, they are not equal. What you can do is look for partial invariance. So when strict invariance, not the strict step, but complete invariance can't be met, you can test for partial invariance. 
So this is like a t this is like a ANOVA to post hocs. So we're looking to see if overall between groups this set of restrictions is okay. If the set of restrictions is not okay, we try and figure out which ones are the problem. So we'll go through and look at each item, and this depends on the step you're on, um, to see if we can figure out which item is the problem. And so what I'm trying to do is meet an invariance criteria. So let me give you a hard example for this. Let's say I have um, the, the first configurable model is okay. The metric model is okay. So we went from a CFI of 0.91 to 908, so we're still within the range, but we went from metric to scalar, and CFI went from 908, right, so let's write these down, whoops, I think it'll be much clearer, okay, so we said configurable equals 0.91, just to make this up on the fly, metric was 0.908, so I compare them to each other, and that's a drop of 002, so I'm okay. okay. Scalar, however, just all goes to heck in a handbasket. So it's 0.88. Okay. Well, 0.88 is a drop of 0.02. Okay. And I said the rule was 0.01. So this is bad. Not invariant. Okay. To get to partial scalar invariance, what I need to do is have a drop of only 0.01. So I need my model to be at least 0.89. Right? Um, or I'm sorry, 8, 8, 8, 8. Uh, no, 8, 9, 8. Oh, math is hard. 8, 9, 8. 8, 9, 8. Um, so this actually is a drop of one, nine, so if we got 908, if all else fails, use a calculator, 0.88, right, it's 0.028, let's just make this easier, 888, I would need it to be 898 to get to partial invariance, so let me explain this one more time, let's say our configure model is 0.91, and the metric model is 0.908. We do expect it to drop because fit is hard. So that's a drop of 0.002. We're okay. If scalar drops to 0.888, just to make math easy, um, that's a drop of 0.02. That's bad. So what we have to do is figure out if there's a way to get to what's called partial invariance or partial scalar invariance specifically, and I need 0.898. Okay. So this is what I need. So we're trying to bring our bad step, our 0.888, up to a good enough criteria, 0.898. And I got 0.898 because that would be 0.01 less than this. Okay, if it goes above that, that's great, but I only need it to reach this level. Okay. And I want it to reach that level in as few items as possible. If you have 10 items and 6 of them are needed to get to this step, that's not really partially invariant. That's pretty much mostly not invariant, um, not equal, and so you want to have a cup, just a couple of items that are the problem. You don't want it to be most of the scale, because if it's most of the scale, you just say they're not equal. At this point, all bets are off. Okay. Um, so how do we tell which items are the problem? Okay. Well, the good thing is modification indices are really useful here. So we can look at how, which paths are going to be the most problematic, and we'll change one of them at a time. Now, we've been talking about how we're adding restrictions as we go, so we're adding constraints is what they're called. And essentially, when you say adding this equality, forcing this particular path to be equal is bad, what you do to fix it is don't force it to be equal. So we let it do whatever it wants. Um, and so we let them be unequal, and we slowly add items up to an acceptable level. So we would slowly add items till we got from 0.888 0.898. That's one of the hardest things to get here is this partial invariance idea that you're trying to take a model that is significantly worse and bring it up to at least a level where it would be considered not significantly worse. Okay. It does not have to be, oops, sorry, 
point nine eight uh, not this one 908 it just needs to be within the range of 0 0.01 or less so hopefully you can do this with a small number of items um, as you get to being over half of the items on the scale it's kind of bad um, usually this is like two or three items or from a very large scale maybe five or six okay no hard and fast rule on that thing though either all right so I've said this before, but most of those previous steps are on manifest variables. So we're focusing on manifest variables because those are our, like scale performance and scale development questions. So do these items act the same across groups? However, we can switch and focus on those latents instead. And generally, this is kind of how things um, tend to go in published papers. So after you've tested that those measured variables are partially or fully invariant, sometimes what will happen is people calculate a latent mean by hand, and they use, by hand, by R, but by hand, and they'll use a t-test to determine if there are different, different by groups. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little more in just a second, but at the very minimum, it's useful to know how to calculate a weighted score for each participant. And this is very similar to calculating a subtotal or a, or a subscale average for an EFA to use it in a later analysis. So maybe you've discovered that some of these items are problematic and you want to know what the weighted score is for each participant. So this is how you do that. Okay. So talking specifically about latent means, because it's definitely the most popular of the population heterogeneity steps. Um, what we normally do is we use EFA and we have CFA to show that each question loads nicely onto its latent and these questions go together. And then we have our set of path coefficients or an EFA or set of loadings, and then we just totally ignore them. So we take those loadings and we say, look how great these are, they all load together. And then we create total scores or average scores and ignore the actual weight to the items. Okay. Now that's, usually done because you don't expect those loadings to be equal across many testing procedures. You expect them to be strong across many testing procedures. Like if I did my EFA over and over on different samples, I would hope that those items would replicate and they would be equally strong. But I don't think it's probably eight, nine, you know, 0. 0.76 every single time. And so I think one reason why we tend to ignore them, other than it's a pain in the butt to calculate these things, <laughs> is that um, I don't totally expect them to replicate every single time. But again, why should I lose that information? Why can't I use it to create a weighted score, which is probably more representative, at least for this particular sample, of their actual latent mean or their overall factor score than just an average for um, all those items. So what you can do is calculate the latent score for each person for each factor, so if you have more than one factor, you have to do this a couple times, by multiplying their score on that item by the loading. Okay. Then you average the loadings or total them, just kind of depending on what uh, traditional scoring is for that scale, and that would be your latent mean. Latent mean if it's a mean, latent total if it's a total. Um, so you will separate that by factors. So if you have two factors, you do one for each separately. So don't average them all together. And the hardest part of that when we get to processing this in R is um, multiplying in the right direction. So making sure you're multiplying the right things times the right things. But should I do this by hand or I could tell you that there's a way to do this as part of the invariant procedure steps, which will make more sense once you um, watch the video with the example. Okay. So the pros and cons for each here. So doing them by hand give me, gives me each person's individual score, which means I can use that in the later analysis. So I have their average weighted mean, which I can then use to predict some other variables. Let's say you're trying to do a validity test or discriminant, um, convergent validity or reliability, anything. I can take that score and I can use it later. Um, the con is it's kind of a pain, um, but if you're gonna do a t-test of the different scores, there's a catch 22 here. You need very large samples 
for CFAs, especially multi-group analyses, because the sample sizes need to be equally large in each group and at least 100 for each group. Um, but then when you test this uh, in a t-test scenario, the degrees of freedom become sample size. And so almost anything can be significant with a large enough sample size. And so you really need to also calculate effect size. So I might find a significant difference between samples, but the effect size might be very small. So you can say, well, it's significant because we had 600 people, but practically this isn't really a big deal. So one pro to doing this is that I get scores for each person and I can use that again. The con is the, then the switch in analysis type switches the degrees of freedom, which if you want them to be significantly different, I guess is good, but also including an effect size to make sure that the, if you say they're different, they really are um, practically different as well as significantly different. Um, doing it through invariance procedure steps is much faster. It's one little line of code. Um, and it is not as biased by sample size because it's tested on um, on the model. So degrees of freedom or difference really is like one or two, three or four maybe, depending on the number of factors. Um, but it doesn't give you those scores to use later. So it gives you the overall latent mean, but it does not tell you um, each, uh, each uh, person's individual scores. So each one has their kind of their place. And then sort of as an end to this, basically what you're gonna do when you do a multi-group procedure is you're really sussing out the differences between groups if they exist by place in the model. So we can focus on the items and test their structure, their intercepts, their weights, and their um, variances, and not quite in that order. Um, and we can also test the latents and understand globally, are there differences, even if there aren't any differences on the average scores, do you get differences on weighted scores in the end? Um, so I like multi-group procedures because it allows me to really make sure scales are doing what I expect them to do um, in a couple of different ways. And it's a great scale development question to make sure your scales work um, the same for different groups of people. And then what we'll do in a couple of videos is talk about item response theory, which is a different approach to the same type of question where are items doing what you expect them to do and you can test that across groups as well using what's called item diff. So do they differ by whatever group set you're interested in? Okay, so that altogether is multi-group confirmatory factor analysis.